Great, thank you, Enrique. Thanks to everyone. Thanks to the organizers for having us. Uh, we're extremely happy to uh, to uh, to be here and uh, and present this paper. Uh, Javier might actually be on the chat. I I, I didn't get a chance to to confirm that with uh, with him. Uh, and so so one thing I would just mention before we start is the usual disclaimer that these are our views and not the views of institutions where we work. Uh, okay, so. The motivation for, 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 for this paper has to do with the fact that macroprudential policy has, uh, as you, you, you all know, um, has emerged as a, a key element of the post-GFC policy toolkit, both in advanced economies and emerging markets. Uh, however, the uh, effectiveness of macroprudential policy uh, is not being taken for granted. Uh, and there is actually a growing empir empirical literature trying to measure uh, how how uh, macroprudential policy works and how it transmits to the economy. Uh, one first other concern that uh, many people have uh, has to do with the fact that macroprudential policy could leak, could easily be uh, evaded, uh, and and that this could have uh, unintended consequences. So, uh, in particular, this raises a couple of uh, questions that we that we ask here. Uh, the first one is uh, how is the transmission of macroprudential of macroprudential policy uh, altered by the possibility of leakages? Uh, another uh, obvious question is whether it remains desirable in the presence of leakages. Uh, and, and finally, uh, if it's desirable, we'd like to know how its optimal design is uh, affected by by the presence of leakages. So what we're doing in this paper is actually fairly simple. We're going to try, try to tackle these questions uh, in what has now become a workhorse model of macroprudential policy uh, in emerging markets. And that's uh, a model based on the, on the work of, uh, of Enrique and, and Javier and, and many others in the, in the, in the room, uh, virtual room. Uh, so in the model that we're going to write, uh, there is a pecuniary externality that results from financial frictions, uh, collateral constraint, embedding, embedding a, a price. That externality is going to make macroprudential policy desirable. However, the presence of leakage is going to lead to the policy being introduced, uh, also leading to extra risk being taken by a shadow sector, which we are going to endow with the ability to bas bypass the regulation. Uh, so there'll be some uh, un unintended spillover effects of the, of the regulation. Uh, and these spillover effects will feed into the economy's uh, exposure to crisis, uh, will limit the effectiveness of macroprudential policy and will potentially alter the optimal design of the policy. So these are the things we're, we're gonna be looking at in the, in the model. Um, so I'll start by sort of um, trying to explain the mechanism in a very simple manner. That's sort of how, what, how we proceed in the paper. Uh, and then, and then I have I'll have some some things to say about the quantitatively more relevant uh, model. Uh, so the model is actually very similar uh, in spirit to what we what we heard today um, in uh, Sebastian's discussion. So we'll have three periods, two goods. Uh, it's going to be an endowment economy uh, with preference that we're going to pick uh, in order to get closed form solutions or closed form characterizations. So we have a single source of uncertainty. That's going to be a shock at day two one. It's going to be a shock with tradable endowment at day two one. Uh, and there won't be any shock after that. So we'll have a distinction between the ex ante uh, stage at day zero before the shock is realized and then uh, ex post stage at day two one. Uh, so we'll have a key financial friction and it's going to be this credit constraint uh, linked to current income that we've heard about uh, in the session uh, just before lunch. And so the novelty we'll, we'll bring in here um, is that we have two types of agents. So we'll have a set of agents of measure one minus gamma that's going to be regulated agents uh, that the planner will potentially be able to, to tax or host borrowing the planner is going to be able to tax. And then we'll also have another set of agents, unregulated agents with measure gamma uh, that will simply be uh, unreachable to the planner and will be borrowing whatever they want, even when there is regulation. Okay, and we think that this is, this is a parsimonious way of capturing a number of different uh, phenomena, such as shadow banking, uh, differences in access to, to uh, sources of funding uh, across institutions or across different uh, agents, and then differences in the ability of uh, borrowers to exploit uh, loopholes. Okay, so this is gonna be, for the most part, uh, something we're going to take as, as exogenous. So who, who can evade and who cannot evade, it's gonna be exogenous, but we have a section in the paper where we show a simple way 
to to endogenize this 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 uh, this parameter gamma that uh, basically uh, represents how how big this leakage concern is going to be or how how big this unregulated sphere of the economy is going to be. Okay, so I'll I'll, I'll uh, show you the household problem here. So the asset is going to maximize utility. Uh, utility is going to be linear for simplicity in tradable consumption at zero and then log um, in aggregate consumption uh, of uh, traded and untraded goods uh, at eight one and two and then we'll have a couple of aggregator uh, of, of the two goods. Uh, maximization is going to be subject to uh, budget constraints at eight zero one and two and then the key again is going to be uh, uh, credit constraint at date one that is going to embed uh, a price. Uh, and so the typical interpretation for this constraint is that households can borrow uh, up to a fraction of their current income. And because it's a multiple, uh, or, or because the, the income comes uh, in the form of, of endowments of different goods, a relative price of non-tradable goods is going to show up in the constraint. And so uh, that's going to lead to uh, both positive uh, uh, elements uh, uh, and, 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 and normative implications. Okay. And then the, the only shock is going to be uh, to the endowment of tradable goods at day two. Uh, so just to summarize a bit what, what, uh, what's going on here and what, what we're doing with this model. So there is overborrowing in this model. Um, and and uh, the reason there is overborrowing is sort of a combination of two elements. One is that uh, the uh, equilibrium rate exchange rate appreciates when tradable absorption goes up. So PN, uh, the price of non-tradables increases in, in CP the consumption of, of tradables. Um, and at the same time, the, this price shows up in the constraint. And so uh, households, when they borrow, they'll impose a negative externality on others. And the way it, uh, it works is that if I borrow more today, then I have less money to spend uh, on, on goods tomorrow. Uh, therefore, I'll spend less on tradables. Uh, that's going to depreciate uh, the relation rate tomorrow. And this depreciation is going to tighten uh, the rate limit, not just for me, but for everybody else. And the part that I don't internalize uh, is, is the fact that it, it goes through market price. So I don't realize that by borrowing more, I affect tomorrow's market price. So in this context, a planner or regulator would want agents to borrow less. And a standard prescription in these models is to just uh, have the planner tax agents borrowing so that they borrow less and, and, uh, and uh, internalize the externality essentially. So uh, what, what we'll have here is that this is going to be an incentive uh, that will drive the planner's decision, but uh, we'll have this other set of agents who will react to, to the tax. Okay? And in particular, there'll be some risk shifting endogenously uh, by the unregulated sphere of the economy. Uh, and so I'll, I'll, I'll show you a little bit how, how that happens and why, 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 why that's the okay. case. So what I'm plotting here is a consumption function, essentially. So consumption as a function of income of unregulated agents, okay? And so if you're looking at the, at the yellowish line, uh, it's, it's, it's a, a depiction of this consumption function uh, at uh, some level of borrowing that is assumed to be the same for regulated and unregulated. So it's, it's an equilibrium consumption function. Um, now, there is a kink. Uh, at the left of the king, the constraint binds. On the right, it doesn't bind. So for high income, it doesn't bind. For low income, it binds. Uh, that's, that, that is standard. And so here, I'm going to be asking what happens uh, to this consumption function when other agents of, this, of the regulated sphere of the economy, when they start to uh, borrow less uh, or, or when, when they come in with more wealth into this period one. And so what's going to be happening here actually is, are, are, are two, two main things. One is that. Uh, the, the point uh, below which the concern is going to start binding for unregulated agents is going to be shifting to the left. Okay, so I don't know if I can show, if, if you can see my, my, uh, my, uh, my mouse, but this line here is basically moving to the left. Okay, so uh, it's gonna be less frequent so, or, 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 or uh, income is gonna have to be even lower uh, for unregulated agents borrowing constraint to start binding. So that's going to uh, make things a little easier in this world for uh, unregulated agents. And then the, the second thing is that even when it is binding, uh, especially in this, in this period, in this region here, where the constraint binds for unregulated agents, but not for regulated agents, because they're coming in with more wealth, uh, then the sensitivity uh, of uh, consumption to the level of income is going to be lower than it is when everybody is constrained, okay? And so compared to the situation where uh, uh, regulated agents were borrowing more, that's going to make uh, low income realizations 
even less painful for uh, unregulated agents. And so th there is spillover going on uh, between the regulated agents borrowing decision and the environment faced by uh, unregulated agents. And in particular, uh, more, um, uh, you know, uh, less borrowing by, re by regulated agents is going to uh, lead to a, to a, uh, a less risky environment uh, or environments where consumption is going to drop less when income is low for unregulated agents. And that's going to lead them to uh, lower their demand for precautionary savings, and therefore they're going to be borrowing more. Okay, so when the planner taxes uh, the regulated, uh, that's going to be great. That's going to that's going to reduce the the, uh, the vulnerability of the economy on that front. But then the unregulated will increase the borrowing and dominance because they're going to be faced with the, with a safer environment where they have to do less precautionary savings because crises are not as bad as they as they would otherwise be. Okay, so the way we proceed, we start by establishing uh, a couple of preliminary results. Uh, so on the positive side, um, we we show that uh, if if we introduce a small tax starting from the the competitive equilibrium, uh, so think about uh, taxing regulated agents. What what happens? Uh, so the the positive effects of this tax is going to be that we'll have less borrowing by regulated agents, which, sort, which is sort of uh, expected, more borrowing by unregulated agents, as, as I just explained. Uh, but on the aggregate, uh, we'll have an unambiguously larger borrowing capacity at date one. Okay, so and, and that's going to be uh, uh, the case because the, first, the, the effect uh, of the tax on the borrowing of regulated is going to be uh, always stronger than the leakage effect on the unregulated. And so it's going to be uh, helping the economy to to uh, to, uh, to 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 have a positive tax, uh, and so that sort of leads me to uh, the next result, which is uh, this normative, uh, and 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 that's going to be that whenever uh, credit constraints bind with with positive probability in the competitive equilibrium without regulation, then a small tax is going to be welfare improving for everyone. And here the intuition is that uh, if we're looking locally at at a small tax. And then the only first order effect on welfare is going to come from the uh, uh, relaxation of the borrowing constraint. So this macro prudential uh, motive that normally is, is, is welfare improving. Uh, and then all other effects are going to be second order and therefore they can be uh, ignored locally. Okay, so that's sort of just to establish that uh, despite the leakage, it's always going to be a good thing to have some tax. And the question is going to be how much more or less than when everyone is, is regulated. So. Uh, then we move to, to analyzing uh, uh, not just a small tax, but in general, what's, what's the best policy in this, in this economy. Uh, and here, I'd like to start with looking at um, the planner's error equation in a, an environment without any leakages. So sort of the, the benchmark case uh, from earlier papers, and, and, and that's, that's going to be similar to what we saw this morning. So uh, what, what we see in this other equation is that there, there is uh, so, so one is the margin utility given the linear the, the, the linear uh, utility uh, uh, insurable consumption at date zero. Then we have this uh, standard term here as well, uh, and then the term that's 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 here uh, on the right is going to be the typical gap between the planner's um, valuation of wealth and the private agent's valuation valuation of wealth in these in these models, and it's it's going to be the product of a couple of terms. One is by how much uh, extra wealth is going to support the price of non-tradables, uh, then by how much this uh, is going to relax the constraint. So that's why the kappa shows up here. And then ultimately, what is the value that the planner associates with, to a relaxation of this constraint? And that's going to be uh, um, uh, represented by this uh, multiplier uh, on the regulated agents borrowing constraint. So this is, this, is, this is sort of the case where like everybody is regulated. That's, that's the expression we, we know from the literature. So what are the leakages going to change here? So leakages are going to change uh, essentially two things. One is that, uh, that that first price effect is going to become more complicated uh, because there'll be some leakage uh, in the sense that more, uh, you know, uh, more wealth or less borrowing for regulated is going to support the price directly, but it's also going to lead to uh, more borrowing for unregulated, which will actually undermine the price or, or lower the price. So we'll have to think about what is the, the, the net effect of these of these two terms. Uh, that, that that's the first the first uh, element, and the second element is that. Uh, we'll have here some weighted average if the planner cares about everyone in the economy between the value of relaxed 
relaxing the constraint for regulated and the value of relaxing the constraint for unregulated. Okay. Now, if we think in terms of how are the leakages changing uh, the the design of the of the of the problem, uh, we we have essentially this first term I discussed that represents the fact that macroprudential policy becomes less effective. Okay. So there is some undermining here of of the policy. At the same time, it becomes more more uh, desirable because. Uh, this this mu u is going to be uh, higher than, than than mu r. So the value of relaxing the constraint for those uh, regu unregulated agents who actually go crazy and, and 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 borrow more in response to the regulation is generally going to be uh, higher than the value of relaxing the constraint of the more cautious regulated agents who who lower the, the their their uh, their borrowing in, in response to the policy. Okay, and so we have we'll have some kind of trade off. So one one uh, element is going to speak in favor of sort of maybe less regulation because it's less effective, but maybe more regulation because it becomes more valuable or more desirable for the plan. Uh, then, then we have an extra term that I'm not gonna to spend too much time on. It has to do with the fact that when, when, when there are different sets of agents and we move prices, um, then we redistribute wealth from the net sellers uh, to the net buyers of, of, the, of the goods in question. Uh, um, and, and that's gonna be happening here as well to the extent that regulated and, and, and unregulated agents will consume different different baskets depending on the on the wealth that they come in uh, into the period with. Uh, but we, we don't wanna stress these, uh, these effects too much. Okay, so if I summarize uh, the insights from the three period model, uh, I basically derived that um, the macroprudential tax uh, increases uh, or a macroprudential tax increases the borrowing by the unregulated sphere. So it leads to leakages. Uh, despite these leakages, uh, a positive debt tax is still desirable. So you can, it's, it, there, 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 there are some scope for parity improvements. And if we're looking at the optimal tax, uh, I just argued that the size of the tax depends on, on potentially on two forces. So I, I showed you the, the other equation, but, but the, the expression for the optimal tax is actually coming from this other equation it, and, and, and it has very similar terms. Uh, so it depends on two forces. One uh, is that leakages make the intervention less effective and that calls for a weaker intervention, but on the other hand, leakages make the intervention more desirable and, and that calls for, for a, a strong intervention. And so we feel that the takeaway from this analysis is that we probably need a quantitative model to assess the magnitude of these different effects. And that's what we, what we do next in the paper. So quantitative model is pretty much uh, the same as with what we heard about this morning. Uh, so we have infinite horizon uh, set up with uh, CR utility, uh, and see uh, and a CES aggregator of uh, tradable non tradable goods. Uh, we'll be focusing on uh, optimal time consistent policy, whereby policies are a function of the uh, minimum state variables. Um, this is a, a case where uh, the fact that we have leakages introduces some time inconsistency problem. We talk a little bit about this in the paper. Uh, there is no time inconsistency problem in the in the benchmark without without leakages. Uh, we solve uh, as a standard model uh, globally. And then we basically explore the properties of the model and uh, of the optimal uh, policy uh, for values of gamma that represent this size of the unregulated sector that uh, vary between zero and, and, and one half. Uh, so zero would be the benchmark uh, setup where everybody is regulated and we kind of know pretty well the properties of the constraint efficient allocation vis-a-vis -vis the, the laissez-faire. And then one half would be a situation where half of the economy is regulated, the other, the other half is not regulated. Okay, so uh, very briefly, the planner problem uh, looks, looks like this in the uh, infinite horizon version of the model. Maybe uh, for those of you familiar with, the, with this uh, sort of problems, the, the only novel sort of difficulty that, that is extra here uh, is um, essentially the implementability conditions imposed on the planners by the fact that unregulated, unregulated agents need to be under other equation. And so the other equation is not a simple other equation because it's sometimes going to be binding. So we have to take into account the complementary stagnant condition that is here. And so that, that is actually what, what gave us a, a hard time when it came to, to solving the model. So we have an extra state variable compared to the, to the one uh, agent model. But then in, in addition, we have this uh, additional uh, inequality constraint together with the complementary sentence condition. Now, uh, we do a, a quantitative analysis with this model. Uh, the calibration that we use uh, largely follows uh, Javier's earlier uh, paper in, in the AER, so I won't, I won't uh, expand too much on this here. I'm uh, calibrating the model on Argentina. And then what we do is we basically conduct some experiments to look at the role of the size of the unregulated sector, 
for different uh, outcomes, in particular for the frequency of crisis, for the severity of crisis, and for the welfare effects of, of the macroprudential policy. So uh, I'll start with the frequency of crisis. Um, so uh, crises are defined in a, in, a, in a standard way, and then we're comparing uh, the probability in the equity distribution uh, in different economies, probability of crisis uh, in, in different economies. Uh, so this is this is that we, we have a situation where uh, or, or a, a calibration where the uh, the crisis happens with about five percent probability in the least fair in the, in the so, so this would be the black line and the constraint efficient uh, allocation would be uh, the the green line so that would be the case where everybody is regulated and that's sort of the, the benchmark from from Javier Sergio paper. Um, and and it's 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 uh, it's it's pretty striking how effective uh, the, the policy is. So it, it, it reduces the uh, frequency of crisis by by about eight uh, eightfold. Uh, and what we what we show here uh, is that uh, when we introduce leakages, which are this uh, purple uh, circle, uh, actually the the frequency of crisis remains extremely similar to what we have when everybody's regulated. Okay, so we see that. As the fraction of unregulated agents in the economy goes up, like from zero to fifty percent, there is some deterioration. Sorry, uh, in in the ability of the planner to reduce the frequency of crisis, but it's really minor. Okay, so even for uh, uh, shares of the unregulated sphere of about fifty percent, where half of the economy is regulated and the other half is not, uh, the the reduction in the frequency of crisis is still is still pretty sizable. It's actually fairly comparable to what we would get. Uh, if if everybody was regulated. Okay. Now, uh, comparing the severity, uh, we uh, do some event analysis whereby we uh, identify episodes uh, of sudden stops in uh, model simulations. We create 11-year uh, windows around this, these episodes. And then we basically try to, to, try to look at uh, how the economy would have behaved under the regulated uh, um, decision rules uh, and so that's something that's fairly easy to do for the constraint efficient allocation so we we we, we do the simulations for for the less severe unregulated so that, that that would be the black line and then we we uh, we feed uh, the same shocks uh, and uh, initial states um, to the 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 economy with with the policy rules coming from the re regulated uh, uh, allocation mechanism um, and, and, and then we, we contrast the different outcomes. And so the, the thing I, I, I would mention here is that when we look at aggregate variables, so it's true for GDP uh, here and for the real exchange rate uh, here, and that would also be true if we look uh, at aggregate consumption or aggregate debt, um, the, the reduction in the severity of crisis that we have in the model economy with the 50% of the uh, population that's unregulated is actually very similar to what we get when the whole economy is, is regulated. Okay, so on the aggregate, it seems like there is very, very little difference um, between an economy where uh, everybody is optimally regulated or just half of the economy is optimally regulated. Okay, now when we look at uh, uh, distribution assets, so when we look at how, how outcomes differ across the two sectors, we see big differences. Uh, and then one, one thing I, I would point out is that uh, in this calibration, we find that uh, the planner actually uses slightly higher taxes in the run-up to, um, to a sudden stop, that would be the purple line here, uh, when there are 50% leakages relative to the case where there are no leakages at all, which would be the, the green line here. And so what happens ahead of a sudden stop, um, basically the planner uh, taxes regulated agents uh, slows down their uh, indebtedness. That's what we see here with tra the trajectory. So this is debt, not, not assets. And then at the same time, unregulated, unregulated agents uh, respond to, to that sort of safer environment where, where they see that regulated agents uh, borrow less and less, while well, they borrow more and more uh, to a point where in the crisis, they are the only ones to, who, who deliver it. So it's a little bit as if uh, the regulated agents had to do all the work to stabilize the economy, and that's sort of the, what what the what the planner chooses to do optimally. Uh, but it's, it it was a bit striking to us that 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 it, it would it would uh, basically take 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 such a such a scope. So uh, uh, 
to summarize, I would just say that like when, when, we, when we look at ag aggregates uh, with the severity of crisis, uh, it's as if the leakages were doing nothing. But then when we look at, at uh, you know, how, how, how different agents or, or, or spheres of the economy are affected, then, then we see very, very big discrepancies. And it really seems like the, the planner is trying to target some aggregates and then does whatever it takes to, to achieve these aggregates subject to the leakages. Uh, so the last thing I want to show uh, are the welfare gains of the intervention. And so uh, they are uh, fairly small as they are in this, in this class of models. Uh, the point here isn't to look at the absolute size, it's more to look at how they're affected by- uh, you have five minutes. Things. That's perfect, thanks. Uh, so it's, 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 it's more to, to, to look at how they're affected by the presence of leakage. And so the green line would be the benchmark where everyone is regulated. And this would be, I don't know, about like 0.13% uh, percent, uh, of, uh, of, of permanent consumption uh, of, of welfare gains. Uh, so th that's our benchmark. And then the purple lines uh, show you the welfare gains as a function of uh, gamma, this share of unregulated agents in the economy um, in, in, uh, in, uh, with, with, with basically like different, uh, different lines. So the, the one with, uh, with circles would be the average welfare gain. Uh, the upper one is the welfare gains for unregulated agents, and then the, the one underneath is the welfare gains for regulated agents. So what we see here, he, see here again is that when it comes to aggregate, so when we do the average between uh, the welfare gains of the, of the different uh, agents, uh, we are surprisingly close to uh, what we get in an economy without leakages. So there are some welfare losses, even in, 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 in the aggregate or, or on average, uh, to having larger fractions like toward the, you know, 30, 40, 50 percent of the economy unregulated. Uh, so we see that this this um, line here is trending down, uh, but it's it's actually but but the welfare gains uh, remain surprisingly close to what what they would be if everybody was regulated. One striking th thing thing one striking thing for us is that uh, there are uh, large disparities in how these welfare gains are distributed across agents. And so what's going on here uh, is that uh, when there are very few. Um, Unregulated agents, that's where the unregulated agents gain the most. And then as their share grows, uh, they, are, they still largely benefit from the intervention, but then the, uh, the welfare gains uh, that accrue to the regulated agents uh, goes down and actually goes down pretty steeply. And so what, what we interpret here, uh, what we interpret this, this to mean here is that there are probably some benefits of the intervention that are uh, uh, social in nature in the sense that the intervention that the planner imposes on regulated agents are going to benefit is, is, is going to benefit everyone in the economy. So we're going to have fewer sudden stops, you know, less frequent and less severe crisis. Uh, th that's going to be good for everyone. But then only one category of agents, the regulated, pay the cost of intervention in terms of distortions to their borrowing decision. And so that's why, um, in general, the welfare gains are larger for, for unregulated because they benefit from the intervention but they, they don't really pay the cost. And then as the share of unregulated goes up, there are fewer, fewer uh, regulated agents who uh, have to basically bear all the cost of the intervention. And that's why the welfare gains uh, seem to be going down pretty steeply for them. And it remains pretty high for, for unregulated. Great, so um, I'll, I'll, I'll now conclude. So what we do in the paper uh, is provide a theory of uh, macroprudential policy with leakages, which we felt was, was lacking. Um, in, this, in this model that we present, um, unregulated agents respond to macroprudential policy endogenously by taking more risk or borrowing more, which undermines the effectiveness of the policy. Uh, macroprudential policy uh, appears to uh, still be effective at limiting both the frequency and severity of crisis, uh, even in the presence of, of large leakages. Um, now, when we look at optimal policy uh, and, and, and optimal taxes, we find that they're not necessarily made smaller by the leakages. Uh, so there are, there, are, there are two forces at play here, uh, but it's, it's absolutely possible. And it, it, is, it is the case in our uh, quantitative work that the taxes are, are optimally chosen to be higher when there are leakages. Um, and then uh, we also find or, or want to show that the average, the average welfare gains are barely affected by leakages. Uh, despite uh, significant disparities across across groups of agents. Thank you.